Hello, I'm Casey Dinges, Senior Managing Director for Public Affairs, Membership, and Marketing at the American Society of Civil Engineers. Thanks for joining us today for a discussion about women engineers' experience in the workplace. I'm joined today by Dr. Ramila Singh, Associate Professor, Lubar School of Business, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and Nadia Fuad, Distinguished Professor and Chair, Department of Educational Psychology, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Together, they conducted a longitudinal study called The Project on Women Engineers Retention, Power, designed to understand factors related to women engineers' career decisions. For more than 12 years, ASCE has made noteworthy strides in raising awareness around the representation, impact, and need to retain women in civil engineering. Thank you for joining us today for this very informative discussion. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Well, thanks for including us today. Tell us a little bit about why you conducted the power study. Well, I had a student who had been an engineer. She had a, ma a bachelor's and master's in engineering and worked for a very large company and decided to leave and come back to school and get a doctorate in counseling psychology and was very interested in engineering careers. And she's the one who said, why don't we examine why women leave engineering? And that's, we brought Romola into the study and that was the beginning. Aren't there some powerful statistics out there that suggest there is an issue? 20% of the engineering graduates are women and that's been true for a good 20 years, but only 11% of engineers are women. And again, that's been consistent for over 20 years. So somewhere along the way, half do, of the women who graduate in engineering don't continue in the field. And this is what our power study did, was to track what happens to these women once they get their baccalaureate degree in engineering and they get into the workforce. Uh, so we tracked four groups of women, a group of women who got their undergrad degree in engineering and did not enter engineering workforce at all. They went on to do some other things. Another group of women who actually went into engineering did a lot of engineering work. And a, a fraction of those folks left engineering and some of them continued, continued on. So our power study is basically tracking the career experiences and career paths of women who got the undergrad degree in engineering and then went on to uh, take different paths in terms of whether they wanted to continue on in engineering or not. And we explored what were the reasons, organizational reasons, situational reasons, personal factors that could have accounted for those differences in the paths that they've taken. Along those lines, tell us more about what you discovered about women in the, in the civil engineering workforce. Well, the first thing that we want to point out is there were no differences between women who left and women who stayed in their confidence. That's, that's been publicly stated in a number of different studies and that, that is really contradicted with our, from our study with a very large group of women. We had about 5,500 women in the whole uh, study. The other thing we found is that there were lots and lots of climate reasons. Um, there were reasons women left because they were not supported at work. There were, their supervisors were, had what we would call in, incivil behavior. Yeah. They were actively undermining them, they were belittling them, insulting them, talking behind the back, uh, doing everything to pull down their performance really. And it was just beyond the patronizing, condescending attitudes that uh, some people had reported. So it was active behaviors to undermine their work performance and product productivity. And those were some of the factors that when we talk about a chilly climate at work, it was not just a perceptual issue where it's like, well, the person did not look at me a certain way or did not say hello to me this morning. It was more of, an active behavior to undermine the work performance and productivity. So we had a lot of these kind of climate factors and the other was the work family climate in terms of to what extent does your organization provide you with the policy and the cultural uh, factors that help support that you do have a life outside of work. So we recognize that, we let you have a, some kind of a balance. So these confluence of factors really kind of pushed women out even though they were trying to make an impact, wanting to advance. Has anything improved in the last five years, say? Well, we, we wish we had the answer to that question. We, I, will, I will follow up on what Romo just said and, and, uh, and say that the women who stayed had some very positive aspects. They saw the environment as having concrete opportunities for advancement. They knew there was ways they could have training and development. They felt recognized by their company. So uh, the converse of the people who left were, had very positive environments. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're arguing that the good news mm -hmm. in that is that these are things that organizations can do. These are just good management practices. What are your key recommendations for civil engineering employers and colleagues regarding how to retain women in civil engineering? 
this is not a pr problem that's unique to women. Once we have that mind shift uh, taken care of, that it's not a women's problem, that the kind of policies and procedures that we want to take uh, put in place apply to everybody. So for example, if we talk about advancement opportunities, if we make the criteria clear for everybody, uh, what are those uh, things that we need to aspire to? What does it take to get promoted up the technical ladder? What does it get, take to get promoted up the management ladder? If we make some of those procedures and paths clear for everybody, it's not just, again, for the women. Uh, same thing for training and development. So investing in women's careers and treating them as a strategic issue and, and just like any other operational strategic issue rather than some kind of an add-on program, but also to have the cultural norms and values recognize that all talent is to be respected, to be valued, and to have a zero tolerance for undermining and incivility at work, really. I think this was um, specific to engineers who were, who were uh, in some cases, feeling overloaded not they the ones who left felt like they didn't have their there were ambiguous messages coming from supervisors that sometimes there were conflicts like I'm supposed to do this I'm supposed to do this I don't know which one to do so making sure another recommendation would be to be very clear about wh what the roles are what the tasks are what the expectations are what's next for your research the couple questions that we had we got after the power study was well what about the men is this all true for men and we thought Good question, and we were lucky enough, fortunate enough, to, that NSF at, thought that was a good question too. So we received further funding, and we are in the middle of um, recruiting men for the exact same comparison study. And then the next thing we got was, well, what are the best practices? How do we know what the best practices are? And while you know we have suggestions based on our our um, study. We also asked for support to do what we're calling the ENGAGE study, which is what is it that keeps engineers embedded and committed and satisfied in their jobs? Uh, thank you very much for, for joining me today for this very informative discussion. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. For more information, visit ASCE's website at ASCE.org. Thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time on the ASCE Interchange. <laughs>